Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture writer, and historian. So it is Tuesday, November 1st, 2022, and we are live. So I wanted to uh, come on and talk about this um, event in history, the Okoye Massacre of November 2nd, 1920. And this was probably the worst uh, day of um, election day violence in this country, probably the most deadliest day of election day violence um, in this country. And even though there were not as many people involved in this massacre as there was in the January 6, 2021 insurrection, you had about 50, approximately 50 African-Americans who were killed. OK, this took place in Florida, in Okoye, Florida, November 2nd, 1920. So uh, we're right around the time of the year where this is the uh, 102nd uh, commemoration of the Okoye massacre of 1920. And you had uh, white supremacists who were trying to keep African-Americans from voting our political power. They feared our political power. OK, also, I'll let you out the uh, online classes that I teach, because uh, as soon as I finish this broadcast, we're going to uh, teach another installment of my uh, online class from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. I teach that on Tuesdays, um, normally 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then on Wednesdays. Um, I teach uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. So we have information in the thread of this broadcast so you can register for those classes. So uh, we're going to look at a few different articles here. Um, this one is from the Zen Education Project, November 2nd, 1990, the Akoi Massacre. Now, here's a picture of uh, Julius July Perry, Julius July Perry. He was a very important uh, African-American man in the um, uh, community there in Akoi, Florida. He was one of the ones who was killed. OK, now, in response to an attempt by African-Americans to exercise their legal and democratic right to vote, at least 50 African-Americans were murdered in a brutal massacre in Akoi, Florida on November 2nd, 1920 on November 2nd, 1920, in what's called the uh, Okoye Massacre of um, 1920, okay? The Okoye, Florida Massacre or Okoye Massacre of 1920. Uh, so they, they go through uh, and give a brief description of what happened, okay? And th this brief description comes from uh, Okoye on Fire, a coy on fire, the 1920 election day massacre. A quiet Florida citrus town became the scene of a gruesome racial cleansing that purged the entire black population for over 60 years. Because uh, there was about 500 African Americans approximately that were, that were ran out of town, left homeless, okay? But behind this massacre. So uh, um, it, now it's important to understand also the timing of this, uh, the timing of what happened. OK. 1920 was two years after World War One ended. OK. Ends in 1918. And then in 1919, you have the red summer of 1919 where you have uh, over, uh, you have about 25 uh, major race riots in this country. And uh, African-American men, uh, World War I, uh, came back home and they, they were saying, we're not gonna take the same uh, racism and segregation and things like this we were dealing with uh, before we left, okay? Before we went to the war, they, they were saying, we want, all of our rights now. We want first class citizenship, for all of our rights now. Okay. Now you have a uh increase, you, you have an increase in the uh, uh 
numbers of Ku Klux Klan members also, and a lot of with the uh, movie The Birth of a Nation, which debuted uh, February 8th, uh, 1915. So you had a research Ku Klux Klan, and that movie showed uh, that movie showed the Ku Klux Klan as uh, the heroes that saved white America from a Negro, from a Negro rebellion. Okay, this reason up here. Uh, this article here deals with history of some history dealing with the Red of 1919. This is an article from um, history.com. History.com is the official website of the History Channel. Red Summer of 1919, How Black World War I Vets Fought Back Against Mobs. Red Summer of 1919, How Black World War I Vets Fought Back Against Racist Mobs. When dozens of brutal race riots erupted across the U.S. in the wake of World War I and the Great Migration, Okay, so the Great Migration basically starts in 1915, and it's 1915 to 1970. And you have uh, about 6 million African Americans migrating from the South up North and out West, all right? When dozens of brutal race riots erupted across the U.S. in, in, the, in the wake of World War I and the Great Migration, Black veterans stepped up to defend Black veterans stepped up to defend their communities against white violence. Black veterans, Black World War II veterans, stepped up to defend their communities against white violence. Okay, so um, there were race massacre. There were um, there were race riots in like Chicago, Elaine, Arkansas. Uh, you have them uh, across the country in 1919, the year after World War. Uh, one ends. Okay. So now this is the year before uh, the Okoy massacre of 1920 uh, happens. Okay. This is the year before the Okoy massacre of 1920. All right. Now, if you go back to the article from the Zen Education Project. So on November 1st, 1920, uh, uh, and also, it's important to note, this was the first uh, election that women had the right to vote also because of the 19th Amendment of 1920, which uh, guaranteed the right to vote for women. So that's taking place at this time as well. OK, so uh, on, on, on the day before Election Day, November 1st, uh, you had Ku Klux Klan Klansmen wearing white robes and they were carrying crosses and they paraded through uh the streets of two african-american communities in okoy florida late into the night with megaphones they warned not a single negro will be permitted to vote not a single negro will be permitted to vote and if any of them dared to do so, there would be dire consequences. OK, so you have this white, these white supremacists going into the African-American community, threatening them the day before Election Day, telling them not a single Negro would be permitted to vote. And if any of you dare to vote, there would be dire consequences. OK, that's voter suppression. That's voter intimidation. Now, November 2nd, Election Day came, and at least some African Americans did attempt to vote in Orange County, Florida. However, none were permitted to enter their respective polling places. White enforcers, white enforcers camped out around the centers, and poll workers were given instructions to deflect their attempts. Now, right now in Arizona, you have white supremacists out there who are armed, who are there observing uh, people early voting. 
okay, and taking pictures of people uh, in uh, 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 taking pictures of people early voting, uh, things like this, okay. This is reminiscent of what what was taking place after what well, one during Reconstruction, but especially uh, after Reconstruction ends, okay. If we look at this um, article here from uh, this is from the Yahoo News, uh, picked up from the Associated Press. Let me go over to this one right here. This is from Yahoo News, picked up from the Associated Press. All right. How's everybody doing? Share this broadcast at social media platform. As soon as I'm done with this broadcast, we're going to teach our Tuesday night uh, online history class from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power. 1865 to 1968 okay and uh, visit our website the theafricanhistorynetwork.com the African because you can register for the class there as well as our wednesday night class um ancient kemet the moors and the mahafa understanding the transatlantic slave trade what they didn't teach you in school okay so now this article is from uh october 31st 2022 Feds concerned about armed people at Arizona ballot boxes. Feds concerned about armed people at Arizona ballot boxes. This is an article that Yahoo News picked up from the Associated Press uh, Monday, October 31st, 2022. So this is history may not repeat itself, but it definitely rhymes. It definitely rhymes. Reports of people watching ballot boxes in Arizona, sometimes armed or wearing ballistic vest, wearing ballistic vests, raise some concerns about voter intimidation. The Department of Justice or the Justice Department said on Monday, October 31st, 2022, as it stepped into a lawsuit over the monitoring, the monitoring. The statement from the Department of Justice comes days after a federal judge refused to bar a group from monitoring the outdoor drop boxes in the suburbs of Phoenix, Arizona. Threats, intimidation, and coercion are illegal under the Federal Voting Rights Act, even if they even if those acts don't succeed, the government's attorneys wrote, while lawful poll watching can support transparency, quote, ballot security forces, end quote, present a significant risk of voter intimidation, the court documents state. The, the, the uh, uh, court documents go on to say, while the First Amendment protects expressive conduct and peaceable assembly generally, it affords no protection for threats of harm directed at voters, end quote, the U.S. government attorneys wrote. Now, the filings, the filing runs counter to a judge's order on Friday, um, that was Friday, October uh, 25th, U.S. District Court Judge Michael Liberti, L-I-B-U-R-D-I, found the allegations present, but found the allegations present, quote unquote, serious questions, but it wasn't clear they were a, quote unquote, true threat to specific people or groups and barring them could violate the watcher's freedom of speech. Now, uh, uh, U.S. District uh, Court Judge Michael Birdie is a Trump appointee and a member of the Federalist Society, uh, a conservative legal organization. And the Federalist Society were one of the two main organizations that provided a list uh, to, to then President Donald Trump of Supreme Court nominees, as well as federal judge nominees. That was the Federalist Society and the Heritage Foundation. Now, the Arizona Alliance for Retired Americans is appealing the order in the swing state of Arizona with several closely contested races this year. Okay. Now, this is the voter intimidation 
that's 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 going on right now, which is reminiscent of what was taking place uh in the uh similar to what was taking place in the, in the 1870s 1860s 1868 opelousa massacre okay all this is reminiscent of the january 6 2021 insurrection and trump racialized the results of the 2020 election when he said there was fraud in the elections in detroit atlanta georgia philadelphia uh, uh pennsylvania and milwaukee wisconsin all four of those cities have very large african-american populations detroit is 80 percent african-american where i live so trump racialized this okay all right now let's go back to november 2nd 1920 uh 102 years ago and look at the voter intimidation that took place then the voter suppression that took place then white enforcers camped out around the um camp the white enforcers camped out around the centers and and poll workers were given instructions to deflect their attempts to, to deflect the attempts of african americans to vote one by one would-be african-american voters were turned away either by threats of violence or by poll workers either by threats of violence or by poll workers who found their names mysteriously absent from the voter registration rolls oh you so you mean their names were purged that's what we call that today the, 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 their names were purged like in georgia their names were purged from the voter rolls pollsters instructed these african-americans to get documentation from notary public rc bigelow to verify that they were indeed registered to vote conveniently however notary public rc bigelow was unable to be located because he was out on a fishing trip that day He's out on a fishing trip on election day, okay? With little other option, most of these African-Americans return to their homes without casting their ballots. Now, Moses Norman, also known as Mose Norman, would not be so easily deterred. After being turned away that morning in his Akoi precinct, and, and, and there were gonna be some African-Americans who early in the day were able to vote but then other ones are not going to be able to vote especially those that come later in the afternoon are not going to be able to vote now after being turned away that morning in his Akoi, florida precinct moses norman rode to orlando florida to seek the counsel of judge john cheney judge john cheney the attorney instructed him to write down the names of any African Americans who were not permitted to vote, and also the names of the poll workers who had denied them their constitutional right based upon the 15th Amendment of the US Constitution. Now, Judge John Cheney said a lawsuit against the uh, county there in Florida could be brought to, cont to contest this violation, okay? A lawsuit could be brought to contest uh, this violation. All right, let's see. give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like on this broadcast. Now, Mose Norman returned to Akoi, Florida with these instructions, along with uh, a handful of African-American citizens, again, seeking to vote because they understood the power of the vote and also they had to pay a poll tax as well they had to pay a poll tax which meant that was a tax that they had to pay to register to vote african americans because they instituted this in florida as a means as an obstacle to the 15th amendment all right now also something something very important to note because florida has a deep rich history of um of voter suppression Okay. Florida has a deep history of voter suppression, and, and uh, Florida is a former Confederate also. 
All right. Now, when we look at, uh, let me see here. Let me pull this up. In 1868, the Florida State Constitution, I want to show you something else because I, I, I dealt with some of this on the African History Network show a couple, week, a couple of Sundays ago. Um, in 1868, Florida writes their state constitution. Now, this is during Reconstruction, okay? Uh, Reconstruction is 1865, 1877. In the class I teach on Tuesdays, Tuesday evenings, we, we deal with the Civil War and the Reconstruction era, things like this, right? Um, this piece here from the Brennan Center for Justice. Let me pull this up. History of Florida's felony disenfranchisement provision. History of Florida's um, felony disenfranchisement provision. And we know it was uh, in 2018 that uh, Amendment 4 passed in Florida with about 65% of the voters voting for it, 65% approval, uh, Amendment 4, and this restored uh, the right to vote to ex-offenders, okay? But then the Florida State Legislature, controlled by Republicans, they then passed another law that stated that you had to pay all your fees and things like this uh, to, try to, to, to try to put another barrier in the way of these ex-offenders being able to vote, okay? So all this, all this ties into racism. Racism is a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race, which comes out of the ideology of European white supremacy. All this ties into racism. All this uh, uh, deals with a fear of African-Americans having power, political power, economic power, et cetera. All right. So if we look at this, um, this is from the Brennan Center for Justice, history of Florida's felony disenfranchisement pr provision, all right? The constitutional provision disenfranchising people with felony convictions was, was originally enacted in the aftermath of the Civil War. In, 18, in 1868, in 1868, as one of several tools to suppress the votes of newly freed slaves. So I was on the Tammy Mack uh, show on the Fox Soul TV network on Monday, October 3rd. And the topic we were dealing with was, is it time to get over slavery? Is it time for African-Americans to get over slavery? And I was on with the uh, on the panel with two black conservatives who were ignorant of history. And they were saying it's time to get over slavery and this and that. and. And, and one of them said uh, African-Americans don't deserve reparations because uh, uh, they were black people who owned slaves. Uh, in 1830, African-Americans owned less than 1% of the slaves. We owned six, about six-tenths of, of, of 1% of the slaves in America. Out of 2 million, African-Americans owned about 13,000. And at least half of those were probably family members that we bought out of slavery. Okay. This is the mentality of a lot of black conservatives. They use that as an excuse to say, oh, African-Americans don't deserve reparations. They skip over the 90 percent plus of the slaves that were owned by white people. They skip over all that and focus on uh, uh, less than one percent that African-Americans own. But what we see after slavery ends are laws put in place to regulate the movements of African-Americans like black codes, but also we see uh, laws put in place to disenfranchise us as well and, and lock us out of, of voting. So we're gonna see obstacles uh, to us voting even before the 15th Amendment is ratified and, and adopted in uh, February of 1870. So even before the 15th Amendment is adopted in 1870, we see Florida doing this in 1868, okay? Now, the, let me try to zoom in on this some, okay? I'll just scroll back and forth, left to right. So I want to make sure everybody sees this. The constitutional provision disenfranchising people with felony convictions was originally enacted in the aftermath of the Civil War in 1868 as one of several tools 
to suppress the votes of newly freed slaves. 100 years later, in 1968, the provision was reenacted despite its history of discrimination and its continuing racially disparate effects. Felony disenfranchisement has long been used to diminish the voting power of Florida's African-American population and the law continues to have that effect, okay? Now, Florida was one of four states where you lost your right to vote forever if you were convicted of a felony, okay? Florida was one of the, the four states where you lost your right to vote forever uh, if you were convicted of a felony, okay? And let me see, I'll give you those other... Uh, states here also because i know i have it here let me see i'll find it because i have a bunch of notes on this here just a second where was that oh kentucky uh iowa and virginia kentucky iowa and virginia Okay, there's an article from Time Magazine that has, I have I have a bunch of I have a bunch of information on this. Okay, um, so so here here's why Florida feared African Americans voting. Okay, pay attention to this. Blacks were disproportionately disenfranchised. This line right here. Blacks were disproportionately disenfranchised under the new provision of 1868 in the Florida State Constitution because state policies at the time were designed to control uh, newly freed slaves through the criminal justice system. Okay. In 1865, three years prior, same year that uh, the 13th Amendment is ratified, December 6, 1865, was legally ends chattel slavery. In 1865, the Florida legislature uh, enacted black codes as a way to control black freedmen, as a way to control black freedmen, the former slaves. This is why we need to stop referring to ourselves as descendants of slaves, because the slaves were freed. Because if you actually study history after slavery ended, they did not keep calling themselves slaves. They refer to themselves as former slaves, ex-slaves, freedmen, black freedmen. This is how you get the Freedmen's Bank or the U.S. the U.S. Bureau of Freedmen, Refugees and Abandoned Lands, known as the Freedmen's Bureau. They didn't keep calling themselves slaves. So why do we refer to ourselves as descendants of slaves? Why do some of us and some people mean well, others don't. Why do some of us keep trying to put our ancestors back into a status that not only were they legally freed from, but they also took up arms and fought to free themselves from, from that status because there were, there were approximately 200,000 African-Americans that uh, 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 fought in the Civil War and fought on behalf of the Union in the Army and the Navy. They took up arms to fight for their freedom. So they didn't, call them, they didn't keep calling themselves slaves after slavery ended, so why do we do that? Maybe it's because we've been taught to have a slave mentality. In 1865, the Florida State Legislature enacted black code way to control freedmen, the black freedmen. A crucial component of the black codes was an expansion of the criminal justice system to deal with minor offenses to deal with minor offenses that legislators believed African-Americans were likely to commit and that had been formally punished by their masters. This is what's taking place during Reconstruction, right? So what, what's going to happen is in Florida and other, other Southern states, they're going to expand the number of crimes that get classified as felonies so that you can increase the number of African-Americans 
that you disenfranchise from being able to vote because you prosecute them and convict them of felonies. This is felony disenfranchisement. And we're going to see this take place after the Civil War ends, even before 1870, the 15, when the 15th Amendment is adopted, but especially after 1870. Black, so, and, and in Florida, what they're doing is they're targeting minor offenses that the white legislatures believe that African Americans were more likely to commit in making those felonies, upgrading them from a misdemeanor to a felony. The black codes had their desired effect by the 1870s and 1880s. Estimates show that more than 95% of the convicts in the Florida convict camps were African American. Uh, a captain in one of the camps at the time noted it was possible to send a Negro to prison on almost any pretext, but difficult to get a white man there, end quote, but difficult to get a white man there. Now, this is what they really feared. The white supremacists in Florida, this is what they really feared. They feared a Negro legislature. Why did they fear a Negro legislature? OK, because 48 percent of the population of the state of Florida in 1868 was African-American as a legacy of slavery. We were almost 50% of the population in Florida and they feared us voting and dominating in the state legislature and African-Americans now writing laws and voting on laws that white people then have to live by. The, 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 same, the same white people that were enslaving African people, now they fear a Negro legislature and these Negroes up here passing laws that white men now have to follow. Felony disenfranchisement in, 18, in the 1868 Florida State Constitution was part of a larger effort to prevent a quote-unquote Negro legislature. Post-emancipation, after emancipation, and the, the former slaves were freed, 1865, legislators in Florida feared that freedmen, not slaves, but freedmen who, but uh, freedmen who then constituted 48% of the state's uh, population would take over state and local government, would take over state and local government because they knew we were going to vote because you don't, you don't vote for exercise. As I said on Roland Martin Unfiltered uh, last Friday, and as, as I said on my radio show, we need to stop telling African-Americans to exercise your right to vote. You don't vote for exercise. You vote for power. If you want to exercise, go to the gym and exercise. Voting is about power. Voting is about being able to get your agenda pushed, getting policies put in place that are beneficial to you, your community, your people, et cetera. Politics is the legal distribution that scares wealth, power, and resources, and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, the adoption, interpretation, and, and enforcement. Okay, the laws and policies shape the economy. They, in, they impact the tax structure. They impact student loan forgiveness, criminal justice reform. They, uh, they impact uh, the SBA, Small Business Administration. Uh, they, they determine which drugs are gonna be legal, they determine which drugs are going to be illegal. They determine uh, uh, the uh, role the Department of Justice has in the Department of Justice investigating policies and practices of police departments. All that deals with politics and law. It has nothing to do with exercising. So voting is about power. And we have to wrap our minds around that concept and understand that we have to be able to push our policies, agendas, the farthest and get the most accomplished, but to be able to understand which policies need to be put in place and understand that whole process, you have to understand history. You have to understand how you got here, the laws and policies that were put in place to put us in this predicament so we know where we need to go from here and how to bring that into effect. Okay, so uh, the 1868 Florida State Constitution contains several provisions 
to prevent this from happening, to prevent a Negro legislature from happening. For example, it established a state legislative apportionment scheme that inflated, inflated the representation of predominantly white counties while deflating the representation of predominantly African-American counties. It also gave the governor of the state of Florida the power to appoint local officials, thereby preventing local African-American majorities from electing their own leaders. This all deals with politics. One legislator wrote that this and other such provisions were designed to quote unquote prevent a negro legislature to quote unquote prevent a negro legislature because they did not fear us exercising they feared african americans having political power and 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 many people still do today this is why you have these voter suppression bills this is why you have these election deniers this is, this is why they fear African-Americans having political power. Now, felony disenfranchisement was yet another mechanism intended to suppress the political power of newly freed slaves. OK, so you have felony disenfranchisement, but also you had physical intimidation and race massacres like the one that took place November 2nd, 1920. So I just want to give you some background, historical information on Florida and the methods they use to suppress the african-american vote in florida okay all right now okay let's continue let's uh let's go back to the piece here from um uh the zen education project because i have to teach this class as soon as i finish this broadcast also how y'all like this type of information uh you can register for our tuesday uh, class that I teach at our online school from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. We'll get deep into this information. And that, we have the information on our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. It's also on the thread of this broadcast. The class is on sale $80, regularly $130. So we'll give you uh, some more information on that. And uh, you can watch, uh, we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch them anytime, even a year from now, two years from now, you'll still have access to the full uh, class. You can go back and watch it. All right. Uh, and we're going to post this here. It says register here. Let me post this here. Okay. All right. Let's continue. Okay, this is the piece from uh, the Zen Education Project. Let's go back to that. Okay, the response by the, uh, let's see here. Let me back up. Um, okay. So Mo, uh, Moses Norman, after being turned away from the voting polls, would not so, be so easily deterred. After being turned away from the voting polls that morning, in his Akoi, Florida uh, precinct, he rode to Orlando to seek the counsel of Cheney. All right. Now, Mose Norman returned to um, uh, Mose Norman returned to Akoi, Florida, with uh, with instructions, along with a handful of African American citizens, again seeking to vote. All right. Now, after being forcibly turned away. Mose Norman demanded the poll workers' names and exclaimed, quote, we will vote by God, end quote. We will vote by God. The response by the cowardly Ku Klux Klan was a massacre of African Americans who were trying to vote because they understood the power of voting and they understood the need for political power. OK, now, 1868, African-Americans were 48 percent of the population. 1920, we were pretty probably still pretty much close to that. Somewhere between 40 to 40 percent of the population in the state of Florida. Now, one of the people killed 
uh, was Julius July Perry. Julius July Perry, who uh, I showed you a picture of uh, a few minutes ago. And he was a very well-respected uh, man in the African, African-American community. Um, he was a labor leader. Uh, he was uh, a deacon in the church. Okay. Now, uh, this information here comes from uh, the documentary Akoi on, Fr uh, Akoi on Fire, dealing with uh, Julius July Perry. Uh, Julius Perry had become the well-respected godfather of the black community. He served as a deacon in the church and the local labor leader or straw boss. It was said that anyone seeking to employ black laborers needed to speak with Julius July Perry first. He was an admired, brave and rational thinker, a sort of civil rights leader before there was a civil rights movement. He encouraged young African-Americans to be educated and stand up for themselves um, as first class citizens. He encouraged young African-Americans to be educated and stand up for themselves as first class citizens. Okay, now uh, uh, Julius Perry's wife, Estelle, his three sons and daughter, Caritha, uh, Caritha Perry Caldwell lived on a large estate that included their home and several barns and outbuildings. They regularly opened their doors to anyone in need. If anyone was in trouble, uh, they knew they could find advice and sanctuary in the Perry home. Okay. All right. They have a link here for some more information. Uh, and there's a video here you can watch dealing with, uh, uh, the Koi massacre also. So check out this article from the Zen Education Project, November 2nd, 1920, the Koi massacre. All right. There was a, uh, there's a really good article from uh, the Washington Post dealing with the Koi massacre also that I want to go to. And uh, this one is called a white mob unleashed the worst election day violence in U.S. history a century ago. Mob unleashed the worst election day violence in U.S. history in Florida a century ago. This article is from November 2nd, 2020, which was the 100th commemoration of the Okoy massacre of November 2nd, 1920. Okay, let me blow this up here. All right. Okay, so if we look at what happened based upon what, what we know, there's some differing accounts, but if we look at what we know was certain. Um, uh, November 2nd, 1920, the same day women voted nationally for the first time, this is a presidential election, Women voted nasty for the first time because of the 19th Amendment. The worst instance of election day violence in American history unfolded in a small town west of Orlando, Florida. And the perpetrators got away with what they did for the rest of their lives. There are no roadside markers in the court. Now, there, there, there is one marker put up in like 2021 uh that talks about uh july perry and what happened to him uh in the in the okoy massacre there's a, a historical marker that was put up there uh 1920 looks like looks like it was put up uh well according to blackpass.org uh june 21st 2019 a historical marker honoring july perry and others killed in the massacre was placed in Heritage Square outside the Orange County Regional History Center. Until recently, many descendants of survivors had no idea they were descendants of survivors of the Okoy, Florida massacre, or that they had been robbed of a valuable inheritance long before they were born. 
let me see here. Okay. Now, Okoy, Florida was founded in the 1850s by a white man who brought 23 enslaved Africans, enslaved African Americans with him. Okay. Uh, after the Civil War, many Confederate veterans resettled there in Okoy, Florida, hiring black laborers to work their land. Starting in 1888, many of the laborers uh, were able to uh, purchase the very acres of land over which they had been toiling from their white employers, bringing, bringing them wealth and security often denied to African-American folks in the Jim Crow South. Now, Florida is still the South and it's still Jim Crow South, but there was still some opportunities that we were, uh, some of us were able to take it, take advantage of in, in uh, uh, Jim Crow, Florida. Florida was also the first state to have poll taxes in, uh, that was in 1889. Okay, that's in Florida also. And a poll tax was a tax that you had to pay to register to vote. So they usually just applied the poll taxes to African-Americans as a way to um, as, as, as a way to put another obstacle in the way of us voting. Now, though it is not uh, accurate to say Okoy was integrated, there was not a blacks only neighborhood uh, across the proverbial uh, railroad tracks as you might find elsewhere in the south okay or like you find found in uh, Tulsa Oklahoma because the railroad tracks in Tulsa that's what separated North Tulsa where African Americans live from South Tulsa where white people live it was interspersed it wasn't like here's a black part of town and here's a white part of town uh, these people were neighbors for 30 years before the massacre happened. Now, after World War I ended in 1918, as we, as we talked about previously here, um, African-American veterans uh, returned home. We saw the same trends happening nationally, uh, take, that were happening nationally take hold in Akoi, Florida. African-American veterans returned home expecting better treatment as they had received in Europe. But white supremacist groups such as the Ku Klux Klan uh, resurfaced to keep that from happening. Racist violence erupted all over the country in what became known as the Red Summer of 1919, as I showed you the article from History.com, the Red Summer of 1919. Now, the 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 term Red Summer comes from James Weldon Johnson. James Weldon Johnson is, is the same man that wrote the lyrics to lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven rings, rings with the harmony of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. OK, so lift every voice. That's James Weldon Johnson. He wrote the lyrics in about 1899, 1899, 1900. And it's his, his, his brother, Rosamond Johnson, wrote the melody. And this becomes uh, years later known as the Black National Anthem. Well, he it was James Weldon Johnson that coined the term the Red Summer because the streets of America were flowing with blood. OK, now the fight for women's suffrage further fueled these tensions in 1920. OK, and, and leading up to 1920, the fight for women's suffrage, uh, the, the fight for the right to vote for, for women, that fuels a lot of these tensions. And the 1920 presidential election was the first election where uh, women were guaranteed the right to vote based upon the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Many anti suffragists or people who were against women having the right to vote argued that if women specifically white women were permitted to vote black men might try to vote too so you had a lot of we had a lot of men who did not want white women to vote or african-american women to vote because they feared that african-american men would want to vote also some 
suffragists or those fighting for the right to uh, a woman to vote denied this would happen and some even argued that white women should be allowed to vote so they could act as a bulwark against african-american men who might try to exercise their rights to vote also so they're saying well look white women can be a the, the vote from white women can be a counter to counter the number of black men who vote so you should let white women vote in Okoy, florida black and white republican leaders held clinics to show african-american residents how to register to vote and how to pay a poll tax and how to pay a poll tax and cast a ballot now the 24th amendment to the u.s constitution banned the poll taxes in 1962. a month before the election two white leaders attorney w r o'neill and judge john cheney who we talked about a few minutes ago both received a threatening letter from the Ku Klux Klan. The letter read, quote, we shall always enjoy white supremacy in this country and he who interferes must face the consequences. We, should always, we shall always enjoy white supremacy in this country and he who interferes must face the consequences. Now, this is what the Klan is saying. Okay, so across Florida, in Daytona, Florida, Jackson, Florida, and Orlando, local chapters of the Ku Klux Klan held huge rallies to intimidate potential African-American voters. Now, Florida may not spring to mind immediately when one thinks of the Jim Crow South, but in fact, there were more lynchings per capita in the Jim Crow in, in Florida than in any other states besides mississippi because we know mississippi was the state that had the most number of lynchings from 1882 to 1968 they had 581 lynchings in florida in, in, in mississippi 581 lynchings in mississippi and this is according to a uh, research by the equal justice initiative now white floridians used racial terrorism white floridians used racial terrorism not just to intimidate voters but also to discourage labor organizing in the orange groves and turpentine farms there in florida so they have uh they have uh the uh, the letter here the threatening letter also okay so you can check that out now, despite the threats, a handful of black residents in Okoy, Florida, both men and women, showed up to the voter poll polls on election day. In the morning, in the morning, they cast their ballots without incident, according to two accounts. But in the late afternoon, a black labor broker named Moses Norman showed up to vote election officials told moses norman that he had not paid his poll tax he had not paid his poll tax he said he had paid his poll tax but he was turned away anyway from the voter polls now moses norman sought help from judge john cheney the white judge who advised him to try again and again moses norman was turned away from the polls it is unclear exactly how or why but that was the spark that lighted a racist inferno that burned black okoy florida to the ground by that evening a white mob had arrived from orlando florida a rumor spread that moses norman was hiding out in the home of julius july perry an african-american landowner and community leader in his early 50s who had been involved in the voter registration drive who had been involved in the voter registration drive july perry's house was surrounded by the white mob at some point two white men shot and killed 
uh, at, at one at some point, two white men were shot and killed. Okay, perhaps by Perry's teenage daughter, perhaps by one another, as they fired weapons at the house. Then, Julius July Perry's house went up in flames. So did the nearby African Methodist Episcopal Church, the AME Church, where Moses Norman and July Perry were trustees, and at least two dozen other homes owned by African Americans were also set on fire. There's a picture of uh, July Perry as well. So basically, the options were leave and get shot or stay and burn. Uh, leave and get shot or stay and burn. And that was said by, uh, let's see, this is Schwartz. Oh, Pamela Schwartz, chief curator uh, of the uh, Orange County Regional History Center in Orlando, Florida. Pamela Schwartz, chief curator of the Orange County Regional History Center in Orlando, Florida. Now, it may be known, it may be never known exactly how many African American residents were killed that night. Newspaper accounts said six. Witnesses remember many more, perhaps 30 or even 60. One person claimed two and uh, two, one person claimed two and a half wagon loads of black bodies were dumped in a trench near the lake. Research is ongoing, but Pamela Schwartz and her team have been able uh, to confirm four uh, African Americans were killed. Three were unidentified burned bodies buried by a funeral home which probably recorded the deaths only to seek compensation for the caskets. The other was July Perry. Now the article from the Zen Education Project puts it at at least 50 African-Americans were murdered. Amazingly, the Perrys made it out of the house alive. Now July Perry's wife and daughter were taken to a jail in Tampa, Florida. Um, were taken to the jail in uh, Tampa, Florida. July Perry was shot in the leg and he was taken to a jail in Orlando, Florida. Now, without within hours, a lynch mob pulled Julius July Perry from his cell and he was brutalized and killed. He was lynched. He was executed. He was killed. His body was left hanging in front of Judge John Cheney's Orlando home. This was the judge that was trying to help him to be able to vote and other African-Americans to be able to vote because they were voting for power. They understood the power of voting. They didn't they weren't voting because they want to exercise. No one was ever held responsible for any of the deadly violence. No one was ever held responsible for any of the deadly violence. Agents of the Bureau of Investigation, which is the precursor to the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the precursor to the FBI, was the Bureau of Investigation. They showed up a few weeks later, but they made it clear that they were not investigating murder, arson, or assault. They were investigating election fraud. They were only investigating election fraud. Now, the leader of the uh, of the mob of the Koi massacre, the leader later became the mayor of Koi, Florida. Then, in this article, it talks about how July Perry's land was stolen. The land that he owned was stolen. Um, there's a section here on page five of this article. 
They talk about the Rosewood Massacre as well. 1923, I've done a presentation on the Rosewood Massacre. July Perry's family was treated out, was cheated out of his land also. While his wife was uh, still in jail in Tampa, Florida, his wife signed over the executorship of July Perry's land to Blueford Sims, Blueford Sims, a Confederate captain and July Perry's former employee. That sounds like a Confederate name too, Blueford. Blueford Sims posted an ad in the newspaper for quote, beautiful little groves belonging to the Negroes that have left that have just left a coy. This is an ad he placed in the newspaper. Okay, he's trying to sell the land that July Perry owned. Quote, beautiful little groves belonging to the Negroes that have just left a coy. Now, after years of litigation, July Perry's children received about $100 each for land that he owned that sold for thousands of dollars. Now, uh, uh, some more background information on Akoi, Florida. Akoi, Florida was a white only sundown town until the 1970s. Now, sundown town means that uh, a lot in a lot of these towns at like five o'clock or something like that, African Americans could work in the town, but the, a, a bell would ring or a whistle would, would blow at like five o'clock or something like that. And that was a signal for the African Americans to get out of the town before sundown hit. Otherwise, you could be harassed, you could be beat up, you could be killed, you could be put in jail. These were sundown times. Florida had a lot of sundown towns. Okoye was one of them. Now, African Americans in the region never forgot what happened there in Okoye, Florida. In the late 1990s, a local activist group, the Democracy Forum, pressed for town halls about the Okoye massacre, some of which included descendants of the perpetrators. Some of which included descendants of the perpetrators. Sometimes the sentiment was, it's better to let sleeping dogs lie, Pamela Schwartz said. 15 years later and 35 miles away, an African-American teenager named Trayvon Martin was shot to death in Sanford, Florida. Sanford, Florida was the same city that Jackie Robinson was ran out of. And uh, we know Trayvon Martin, his, that sparked, sparked a nationwide, nationwide protest and the Black Lives Matter movement came out of the, the protests surrounding the killing of Trayvon Martin. In 2017, members of the Democracy Forum approached the history, the, approached the history center with this archive of the Okoy massacre. They also asked for a 100th anniversary commemoration in 2020. Now in 2018, the city of Okoy, Florida released a proclamation acknowledging the massacre a formal apology to the to the descendants is in the works and the Florida legislature uh, has passed a law requiring that the Akoi Election Day massacre be taught in Florida schools. OK, now they should also teach about August 27th, 1960 in Jacksonville, Florida. You all familiar with that? Axe Handle Saturday? Axe Handle Saturday uh, saw about 200 uh, Ku Klux Klan members. They beat civil rights activists who were sitting in at the lunch counters in Jacksonville, Florida. They beat them with axe handles. Okay, that's that's August 27th, 1960. In in Jacksonville, Florida. And that's called Axe Handle Saturday. This article here from the Washington Axe Handle Saturday. Axe Handle Saturday, the Klan's vicious attack on black protesters in Florida 60 years ago. 
This is an article, uh, August 27, 2020, by uh, Sydney Trent. This is one of the uh, this is one of the civil rights workers who, who who was beaten. Okay. Um, this caption says a Jacksonville uh Florida police officer stands with Charles Griffin after he was attacked. Stands with Charles Griffin after he was attacked on August 27th, 1960, during the lunch counter protest by civil rights activists in Florida. This picture is courtesy of the Florida Historical Society. Okay, so uh, read about uh, Axe Handle Saturday. This also happened in Florida. Let me go back to this other piece here. How y'all like this type of information? Give us a thumbs up, give us a heart, give us a like. We'll go back to this in just a second. If you like this type of information, you can register for the online history classes that I teach on um, Tuesdays and Wednesdays. As soon as I finish this broadcast, we're going to do our Tuesday, uh, November 1st class. Uh, but I'm, I'm preparing. I have to do a presentation for uh, the Midwest Decarbonization um, Environmental Summit on Wednesday. I'm speaking there Wednesday and Friday. It's a virtual summit. Uh, we have the information on our fan page. You can register for that, and we'll put it on our website also. Uh, so I'm running behind schedule today. But you can uh, register for the online classes that I teach. We have the link here in the thread of the broadcast. It's also on the homepage of our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. So when you scroll down the page, uh, you'll see the information for the radio show. You'll see our cash app and PayPal information. Uh on Wednesdays, I teach ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. So uh, we teach that class on Wednesday, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That, that class is on sale $80, regularly $130. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime. So even a year from now, two years from now, you can watch the entire class. Then on Tuesdays, um, I teach from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. Okay, it's the same uh, cost and the same um, structure, uh, structure of the class. And we have a bundle pack where you can register for both classes um, on sale, $130. That's a, a over $300 value. And you click right here to register here. You can use debit card, credit card. If you've taken any of my online classes in the past, email me uh, at ahnshow at theafricanhistorynetwork.com, ahnshow at theafricanhistorynetwork.com, or just click right here on contact the African History Network. Okay. And um, it, uh, you can uh, email us right through uh, the website. Okay. You can email us right, right through the website. All right. All right. Uh, let's continue here. Okay, I want to go back to uh, quickly this article here from the Washington Post. And then there's a quick article that I want to show you from uh, blackpass.org has some information on this also. Um, like Pat. And then I'm and, and then there was a um scholarship set up. Okay, for the descendants. So I want to talk briefly about that because I talked about this on the African History Network show when this article came out June 4th, 2021, dealing with the with, dealing with the scholarship that was set up uh for the uh for the descendants. Let me go back to this one here. Okay, the article from the Washington Post, a white mob unleashed the worst election day violence in US, in US history. A white mob unleashed the worst election day violence in US history in Florida a century ago. If we go back to uh, that article, uh, the last page, page six of the article, it says the property where the AME church used to be that was burned down 
is now a Mexican restaurant. The main road is named for Blueford Simmons, although there's a petition to change. And the Blueford Simmons was the former Confederate who July Perry's wife signed over July Perry's land to, she signed it over to Blueford Simmons, the white, Blueford Simmons, the white man who took out the ad in the newspaper to sell the land. A newer house stands where July Perry's home used to be. When, when reached by a Washington Post reporter, the homeowner said he, quote, didn't know anything about that before ending the call. Before ending the call. That's interesting. I would want to know more. Really? There was a massacre here? And African Americans were ran out and at least 50 were killed and 500 had to flee? I want to know more about that. Now, maybe if my ancestors were involved in running them out, maybe I wouldn't want to know about that. This past summer, summer 2020, when this article came out, this past summer, as the History Center put the final touches on its exhibit, the nation erupted in protest after the killing of another African-American man, George Floyd, May 25th, 2020. One evening, one of the staff members went to a Black Lives Matter protest in Orlando, Florida, where she was surprised to see a young man holding up a sign that read, July Perry, Okoy, Florida, November 2nd, 1920. Jennifer Jenkins and Samantha Schmidt also contributed to this report. Read this article here from uh, the Washington Post. A white mob unleashed the worst election day violence in U.S. history in Florida a century ago by Jillian Kale, November 2nd, 2020. They were not afraid of us exercising. They were afraid of us having political power. And many people still are afraid of African Americans having political power today. The Now, now what's interesting, the, the piece from uh, blackpass.org on this, and it's just one part I want to highlight. You can read the rest of it. And we deal with a lot of information like this in um, the online classes that I teach. Let's look at this right here. Um, okay, the Okoye Massacre, 1920. Here's a picture of July Perry. But I want to uh, look at something here. Now, Walter, Walter White of the NAACP investigated the massacre. Um, and he, he, he passed for white, okay? He passed as a Caucasian during the visit. He could pass for white. That's how light-skinned he was. He reported that some locals were, quote, unquote, still giddy with victory. Some locals were still giddy with victory when he arrived. He also said that locals reported 56 African-Americans killed, but he claimed 30 deaths in his official report. In 1921, the NAACP and other civil rights organizations called on the House Election Committee of the U.S. Congress to investigate the massacre and black voter suppression in Florida, but the uh, U.S. House of Representatives failed to act. This is what the NAACP was doing in 1921. Um, okay, here's the, his, here's the um, historical marker. It says lynching of July Perry, November 3rd, 1920. Okay, uh, here's the historical marker. On June 20, on June 21st, 2019, a historical marker honoring July Perry and others killed in the massacre was placed in Heritage Square outside the Orange County Regional History Center. OK, now th th there's a part here. Um, this part right here. The mob then turned on the black community of Okoye, Florida. They burned down homes and businesses 
and demanded that the black residents leave Okoy, Florida, and demanded that the black residents leave Okoy, Florida. In the face of this threatened violence, the entire, in the face of this threatened violence, the entire uh, African American population fled the town. Some African Americans speculated that the rioting may have been planned so that some whites could seize the property of the wealthiest blacks in the town. Now, I don't, to be honest, I, I don't know if that's why, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was. I, I, I don't have evidence to prove that's what happened, but I wouldn't be surprised if that was true. Some African-Americans speculated that the rioting may have been planned so that some whites could seize the property of the wealthiest blacks in town, especially if, if those African-Americans like actually live there in Akoi, Florida, or if they have um, like firsthand accounts of, uh, 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 of some who were survivors and this is what they're saying. I'll, ta I'll, I'll take that word for that because they know better than they were there. Right. And they know the white people they were dealing with. They were there. So if that's what they thought. I, I, I would go with that. OK, so read, read. You can read this full uh, article here. The Quay Massacre 1920. All right. Now, there was a. Uh, let me see. Vice.com has an article on this that I've read. Um, this piece from Vice. That time, white people burned and pillaged a black community on election day. Okay. All right. All right. We're back. Okay. Stand by. Okay. We're back. You should be able to hear me. All right. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Okay. We're back. All right. Okay. Let's continue. Uh, there, there was an article from vice.com on the Koi, Florida uh, massacre. Uh, it's just one part that I want to highlight here. Um, where is that one? This one right here. The name of the article from uh, vice.com is White People Burned. Let me see. That time, white people burned and pillaged a black community on election day. Let's pull this one up. This is from Vice. That time, white people burned as the black community on election day. The 920 massacre in Okoy, Florida, involved white lynchings, castrating, and removing hundreds of blacks from their land in retaliation for them trying to exercise their right to vote. But they didn't fear us exercising. They feared us having political power. And this is why now that now we were voting. Right. 
in spite of the felony disenfranchisement law written into the Florida State Constitution in 1868 to prevent a Negro legislature. OK, we, we, we were voting despite all of that. All right, now there is a let me see which which article is this here. Okay, there's a part I want to go to. Oh, and this article is written by Deborah Douglas. Deborah Douglas. It's important to understand this chronology of history because this happens two years after World War II ends, and this happens 1920, the year after the Red Summer of 1919. Election Day 1920 gave us one of the most violent, horrific stories in the democracy. And, and, and unfortunately, despite laws and the unimaginable racism that precipitated the carnage, it's a tale that has largely been left untold. So we saw the uh, presidential election between uh, Warren G. Harding and James M. Cox, a Warren G. Hardy won the presidential election. The events began when a white lynch mob, with a white lynch mob hanging one black man, and it culminated with an even larger mob terrorizing and torching the homes of an entire community of African Americans. In the end, some historians estimate that as many as 500 African Americans were forced from their homes. These people ran for their lives after, after being given the ultimatum, die or flee. Today, this bloody snapshot of American history is referred to as the Akoi Massacre. Uh, I want to go to this part right here. And uh, skip down, uh, go down a little bit. And yet the opposition to black voting was immense leading up to the November 2nd, 1920 election. It helped fuel the resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan throughout the South because the Klan gave, gains a lot of power in the 1920s. They're, they are increasing their numbers and gain a lot of power and political power in the 1920s. Because the Klan had largely, by 1915, the Klan had largely died out. They were not, throughout history, just a dominant organization. No, they, they were founded December 24th, 1865 in Pulaski, Tennessee. Later in the same month that the 13th Amendment is um, adopted. It's uh, ratified December 6th, 1865, when Georgia ratifies the 13th Amendment. It's adopted December 18th. Then about a week later, the Klan is founded. Okay. Uh, so by 1915, a lot of the originate, a lot of the early members of the Klan have died out. The KKK responded to voter registration drives for African Americans in Florida by holding its own hostile demonstrations in cities like Miami and Orlando, threatening the kind of violence and terror that it ultimately perpetuated in a coy Florida and Akoi, Florida, with impunity. Okay, I want to skip to page. Uh, I want to skip page uh, um, two. Okay, this is uh, um, that the, this picture here is in Rosewood, Florida, 1923. A black home set on fire by a violent white mob in Rosewood, Florida. That that was um uh Jan that was January 1923, the Rosewood, Florida, uh, Rosewood, Florida massacre. The movie Rosewood uh from director John Singleton starring Bing Rames and and uh uh John Voigt. That's about the Rosewood massacre. Uh, I want to go down to see. Uh, Drunk off the violence and lusting for more blood, the white mob turned its wrath on two black areas of Akoi, Florida. 
The mob set fire to rows of black owned homes, black churches and black schoolhouses. The African-Americans in the community tried to fight back using firearms in shootouts. But the white mob prevailed and went about torturing anyone who, rem who remained. One African-American man named James Langmead, L-A-N-G-M-E-A-D, refused to leave. For his valiance, according to Fusel's account, he was castrated. Quote, one woman heavily pregnant had stayed in her home because she did not think she could run fast enough to escape the deputized whites, um, writes Fuso. And Fuso is, hold on, let's see. So I have a bunch of articles on this. Uh, da, 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 da. That was Melissa Fuso. Um in the William and Mary Law Review, she has a piece, she has an article in the William and Mary Law Review. That's Melissa Fuchsia. Her, quote, her mother unknown perished with her in the flames. One man hiding in the barn tried to escape when the mob set fire to the barn, but ran back inside to his death after the mob shot at him, unquote. Now, as many as 50 African-Americans were removed from their land, as many as 50 African-Americans were removed from their land after the violent riot uh, or massacre, the Ku Klux Klan set an embargo around the town of Okoy, Florida to ensure that none of them could come back to their homes. In the meantime, the, white, the whites seized the property sometimes with deeds requiring that the land quote never be conveyed to negroes again that's called a, a that's called a restrictive covenant a restrictive covenant a restrictive covenant is a way that was used to keep african americans from buying property especially in white areas and lock us out of wealth building through buying homes through buying real estate it was written into the deeds that you cannot sell this property to a Negro. Okay, that's called a restrictive covenant. So what some of these white people did was they ran us off our land, killed us, took our property, and then wrote into the deeds that the land, quote, never be conveyed to Negroes, end quote, again. They didn't fear us exercising. They feared us having political power. This is why you have to understand history and law. Because history and law and politics, all that intersects. Politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources, and the writing of law, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, their adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. Okay? All this is connected. Now, there was a uh, last last article. How's everybody doing? Give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like on this broadcast. Be sure to register for uh, our online uh, online class because uh, I'm going to teach one. Uh, as soon as I finish, we're going to do our Tuesday class. I'm running late, but we're going to do an hour of our Tuesday class um, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. And then um, on Wednesdays, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Wednesdays, I teach ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school. Okay, there was a article from June 4th, 2021, from MiamiNewTimes.com. And I talked about this on the African History Network show when this story came out. So that was June 2021. 
Let's look at this. Uh, Florida approved scholarship fund as reparations for 1920 massacre. Let me pull this article up just a second. I'm going to post the information here. You can register for the help support the African History Network. Help says keep doing the research, stay in the air, keep broadcasting. Okay. Also, um, you can support us through Cash App and PayPal, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. And so let's keep doing the research also. Uh, November 8th, Tuesday, November 8th, uh, I will be in Washington, D.C. And uh, on the um, six-hour broadcast, actually, like it's going to be seven-hour. Uh, uh, the seven-hour uh, election. Uh, what the hell is this doing? So I can hear it. Let me refresh the screen. Okay, we're back. Okay, so um, I'm going to go to this last article here in just a minute. Tuesday, November 8th, I will be in Washington, D.C. I will be uh, one of the panelists, one of the uh, political commentators, political analysts on uh, Roland Martin Unfiltered, a special six-hour broadcast election day broadcast for Roland Martin Unfiltered. You know, I'm a panelist uh, every Friday on Roland Martin Unfiltered. So um, I leave uh, leave out Tuesday morning, flying to DC. Okay, and uh, if you wanna support us, you can uh, uh, also support us, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App or through PayPal, paypal.me for what slash the AHN after I'm paying my way there, but I'll be in studio. Be the first, my first time uh, being in uh, their studio. Their broadcast, their election day broadcast, dealing with the returns, uh, is uh, 6 p.m. to 1 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. 6 p.m. to 1 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can watch that on the Black. Download the Black Star Media app to your phone, or watch on Facebook or YouTube at Roland S. Martin. I'll share the broadcast on our fan page also. Okay. So this piece here is uh, Florida approved scholarship fund as reparations for Nate Massacre. This is from my, MiamiNewTimes.com. MiamiNewTimes.com. And I'll, I'm also going to post the information here, uh, the link where you can register for uh, the online classes also. This is. Um, on our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. So very briefly here, this is one good thing that no good Ron DeSantis did do. Even a broken clock is right twice a day. You still don't want to use, you still don't want to use that clock to tell time by. Um, this week, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis signed a state budget bill that includes a scholarship program for the descendants of, of the victims of one of Florida's blood, bloodiest incidents of racial violence. The scholarship is a rare instance of reparations for wrongs committed against African-Americans in the U.S. The Randolph Bracey Okoye Scholarship Program is called the Randolph Bracey a, a, a Koi scholarship program named for the item's sponsor, Senator Randolph Bracey. Um, this scholarship will award 50 college scholarships of up to uh, $6,100 uh, per student for students whose ancestors were victims of the 1920 Okoye massacre an election day bloodbath that targeted African-Americans in the central Florida city of Okoye. 
Now, the bill that no good governor Ron DeSantis signed in Florida needs to be desanitized of Ron DeSantis. The bill uh, makes no explicit mention of the term reparations and intentional omission on the part of uh, its sponsor, okay, Senator uh, Randolph Bracey, to help the bill pass through the Florida State Legislature. And this is something that I've, been, that I've said, talked about on my show before. Um, it, it makes sense to take the to take the, the it makes sense to take the uh, name the title or the word reparations off of what we want because when you start talking about reparations that automatically uh, brings about a whole lot of backlash okay and because if you understand the federal legislature. The majority, the majority of the people in the House and the Senate that have to vote on these bills are white. And the majority of their constituents, generally speaking, the majority of their constituents overall are white also. So whatever policies we want, it'll make more sense to take the term reparation for it and just push the policies as opposed to that as opposed to having a reparations on it because that becomes a focus of white backlash reparations and then you get you have people say oh my ancestors didn't own slaves things like that well first of all nobody asked you if your ancestors own slaves or not then you gotta get through all that just deal just deal with the laws and policies put in place that have now distributed wealth, power, and resources, and deal with the policies that need to be put in place and how it how it's good for America in general, and take the take the name reparations off of it. When you study the history of slavery in this country, there was a reason why most African slaves who ran away ran away at nighttime and not in the daytime. Because if they ran away at daytime, it'd be much easier to see what they were doing and it'd be much easier to catch them. If you if you look at um, Tommy Tuberville, Senator Tommy Tuberville of the state of Alabama. And if we look at the um, article, so he, he made some ridiculous statements a couple weeks ago and he says something to the effect of and i have, I have the article here because th this quote from the washington post deals with um it deals with how the gop how republicans are using a lot of coded language and these are all, see, I do a lot of research. These are all like recent articles. Um, okay, this, this, this stack here deals with midterm elections. Like this stuff right here. Why Republicans are focusing so much on crime and inflation. This is from the one 17th, 2022. See, this, this stack here deals with midterm elections. Hold on, there was this piece. Was it in this stack? There was one, I just saw it. Hold on, let me find this. Cause this deals with the coded language that they're using. And he says something to the effect that uh, uh, the Democrats want reparations for the people who are out in the streets committing the crimes. Where's that article? That's not, uh, I think it's in this one here. Is it, is it in this one? I just saw it. Racist GOP appeals heat up in final weeks. Yeah, this is here because I was dealing with uh, Louisiana. Louisiana wants to change who gets counted as black. It's a lot more African-Americans out of voting. 
uh, they, they, uh, this deals with the redrawing of the congressional districts. Okay, th so this this article right here. Let me pull this up from Washington Post. And this is from October 15, 2022. Uh, racist GOP appeals heat up in final weeks before midterm. Uh, let's pull this up. All right, a hey, Robert Harris. Okay, thanks for the uh, support through Cash App. Really appreciate that. Definitely need that. Racist GOP appeals heat up in final weeks before midterms. The toxic remarks appear to be receiving less pushback from Republicans than in past years. Because they've been, because it's the it's the white nationalist party, and they've been co-opted by Donald Trump, and the election deniers, and the coup plotters, and the QAnon conspiracy theorists. This is from October fifteenth, twenty twenty-two, by Liz Goodwin. Now, this is dumbass Senator Tommy Tuberville. He used to be a college football coach. Never, he didn't. He didn't serve in uh, 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 the, the Senate before. He didn't serve in the politics before. He was a football coach. And then in Georgia, they go get a, a former Heisman Trophy. Never served an elected official. He's an honorary sheriff running around with his sheriff's badge, talking about he has power. He can help the the police and stuff like that. He he, he does not have arresting power. He has an honorary badge. Herschel Walker, another woman's come out and said that uh, uh, he forced her to get an abortion. She did an interview and, and showing her face. She's a white woman. Uh, surprise, surprise, surprise. Okay, where is this one? Uh, hold on, where did it go? A second okay so yeah senator tommy tuberville republican of alabama addresses a campaign rally in minden tahoe airport at the minden tahoe airport on october 8th 2022 in minden nevada senator tommy tuberville suggested at a rally in nevada this uh, in october that african americans are criminals a day later in Arizona, dumbass Marjorie Taylor Greene, Republican of Georgia, appears to refer to a specious conspiracy theory about immigrants that has been associated with white nationalists, baseless claim that at least two GOP candidates for the U.S. Senate have echoed. In Wisconsin and North Carolina, Democratic candidates for Senate have faced a barrage of ads on crime that feature mugshots of black defendants. These are ads Republicans are running. Now, as the campaign heats up in the final weeks before November's midterm elections, November 8th midterm elections, so have overt appeals to racial animus and resentment. And the toxic remarks appear to be receiving less pushback from Republicans than in past years. See, because like Republicans like John McCain, who would have pushed back, John McCain of Arizona, who I disagree with pretty much every bill that he voted for, largely speaking, John McCain would have pushed back on something like that. He's dead. He's not in the Senate anymore. He's he, he, John McCain would have pushed back on something like this. And the toxic remarks appear to be receiving less pushback from spineless, spineless Republicans like punk ass Lindsey Graham out of South Carolina than in past years, suggesting that some candidates in the first post Trump election cycle is election cycle have been influenced 
by the trader the, by the former trader in chief's norm breaking example now michael Steele, african-american michael Steele, who's the former republican national committee chair and they kicked him out okay uh rush limbaugh didn't like michael Steele, and uh they, they kicked michael Steele out he said quote anybody who's got a little who's got a title in the party could say something senator governor anybody he noted a deafening silence in the party after senator tommy tuberville's comment quote anyone could stand up and say can we stop this please but they won't but they won't at the nevada rally that was staged by donald trump in the town of minden okay uh, on uh, saturday october um that would have been october 15th saturday october 15th for the state for the state's top republican candidates senator tommy tuberville called democrats quote unquote pro crime pro crime even though the um the red states some of the red states have more crime than some of the blue states I'm going to pull up some information on that here just a second. Uh, okay, I'll pull up some information on that here in just a second. Now, the teacher's class, too. We're going to do an hour of the class to, uh, today. Quote, they want crime, he continued. They want crime because they uh, want to take over what you got. They want crime because they want to take over what you got. They want to control what you have. They want reparations because they think the people that do the crime are owed that. Now, this is what Senator Tommy Tuberville of Alabama, Republican, said on the campaign trail. October 15th, he said it's in Nevada, October 15th, 2022. He said the Democrats want crime. They want crime because they want to take over what you got. They want to control what you have. They want reparations because they think the people that do the crime are owed that. Just so people understand, no Republicans in the House or the Senate support reparations, not even the black ones. Not Senator Tim Scott of South Carolina, not Burgess Owens of Utah, not Byron Donalds. Uh, is it Byron Donalds or Brian? No, one of the dumbass um, out of um, uh, Florida. Brian Donalds, that idiot. Is it? Is it? Hold on, which one? Yeah. Uh, no, I want. Well, hold on, hold on. It is. I want the black guy married to the white woman. Hold on, just a second. Let me find the right one. Yeah, this this dumbass right here. Go, go research this guy. Roland interviewed him on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Most of the policies that are beneficial to African Americans, this idiot voted against them. Then I went to the Twitter page, saw he's married a white woman. And because when I when I saw him on Roland Martin Unfiltered, I'm listening to him. He voted against the American Rescue Plan. He voted against the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. He voted against the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Then I went to his Twitter page and married to a white woman. Oh, that, that makes sense. See, I can tell, I see why he's smiling. Protecting Florida's most important, important national resource, white supremacy. That's what he's protecting. Meet Byron. He has spent his entire adult life serving others, whether it's through violent others, okay. Now the question Byron needs to ask himself 
Byron Donalds, the question you and Burgess Owens and all these Negroes out here that are supporting these, the, the, the part of this white nationalist party and support these white supremacists, the question you need to ask yourself is what happens to you when you have outlived your usefulness to white supremacy? That's the question you really need to ask yourself. At, ask Michael Steele, who is the African American chair of the Republican Party. They pushed them out of the Republican, they pushed them out of the chairmanship. They pushed them out of the chairmanship. And, and Rush Limbaugh was a big adversary of Michael Steele. Ask Amarosa when they threw Amarosa out the White House. Ask Herman Cain. Ask Herman Cain. Herman Cain um, died of COVID. And Herman Cain was in the hospital. Donald Trump did not authorize Herman Cain to have the experimental COVID drug that Donald Trump say, took that saved his life. Herman Cain was a big Donald Trump ass kisser. He died of COVID. Hmm. Okay. The question you need to ask yourself and all of them, what happens when you have outlived your usefulness to white supremacy? So this is what Tommy Tuberville said. Attacking reparations and associating African-Americans with crime. Now, a debate over whether to provide reparations or compensation to the descendants of people formerly enslaved in the United States, formerly enslaved in the United States, has existed in the country for decades. By invoking it, Senator Tommy Tuberville appeared to link African-Americans to crime in a battleground state where Republicans are fighting to gain one Senate seat and with the potentially the majority in the Senate. So they can stop uh, President Biden's federal nominations to the federal bench. Okay, he's gotten like about 84 of his nominations to the federal bench. Federal judges confirm they can stop his nomination. They can block his nominations to the U.S. Supreme Court. You won't be able to get bills passed in the Senate. Or it's going to be very hard because the Senate majority leader controls which bills come to the Senate, for, Senate floor for debate or for a vote. And if Mitch McConnell is Senate Majority Leader, he's going to shut down all this stuff. Like he did when Republicans took control of the Senate in 2014. And, and, and for all the people who think, oh, Republicans are going to do, uh, do a better job. Uh, yeah, that's right. See, Herman Cain was at the, um, uh, I, I talked about this when it happened. Herman Cain, there was a big Trump rally. It's a super spreader Trump rally. Herman Cain was there with a bunch of black Trump supporters they, and they weren't wearing masks. Most of the people at that Trump rally, it was an indoor Trump rally, most of them weren't wearing masks. We don't know for certain that he got COVID from that super spreader event, but it's most likely that he did. We don't know what more sense certainty he got COVID from there, but it was shortly after that event that he came down with COVID. And he took a picture and he had the, he had the picture. He had the picture on his Twitter page. I think it was Twitter, maybe also Facebook, but he had it on his Twitter page. Taking pictures with the other African-Americans there with that Trump hats on all this stuff, not wearing masks. And he had information on his Twitter page, mocking wearing masks. And he caught COVID and died from COVID. What happens when you have outlived your usefulness to white supremacy. And then when they had the Republican National Convention, it happened after he died. They didn't even mention his name. This was during the, the 2020 presidential election. They had the Republican National Convention. They televised it. Okay. It was on mainstream TV. They televised it. They didn't even mention his name. You know, you know, like at the Grammys, they have like a, 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 a section at the, the a segment of the Grammys, like, the, the entertainers and the music stars that they lost this year, okay? And they play the music and on the big screen, they show their name and things like that and their, their birth date and the date they died and they, they have the scroll and they show the different one. They didn't do that for Herman. The, 
the remark by Senator Tommy Tuberville drew condemnations from civil rights leaders and Democrats, but most Republicans stayed silent or offered over only mild responses. Representative Don Bacon, Republican from Nebraska, said, I'm not going to say he's being racist. He said this on NBC's Meet the Press when asked about the comment. He said, quote, but I, I would not use that language. Be more polite. A spokesman for Senator Tommy Tuberville used to be a, a football coach. And just because he's a football coach doesn't mean he should be a U.S. senator. Just like just because he's a great football coach, does that mean he should fly a plane? It's like the analogy that President Obama just made about Herschel Walker is a good analogy. If you're going through an airport and you saw Herschel Walker say, hey, that's Heisman Trophy winner Herschel Walker. Let's get him to fly the plane. Because now I want to ask, OK, does Herschel Walker have a pilot's license? Has he ever flown a plane before? I mean, sure, Herschel Walker may say, hey, I've never crashed a plane before. Well, you've never flown a plane before either, you dumbass. The racial invective, back to the Washington Post article, the racial invective has come at a time when Democrats are dealing with their own scandal in Los Angeles where Democratic City Council members and a labor leader were recorded making racist statements. Two of them resigned this week after Democrats, including President Biden, called on them to do so. Corrine Jean-Pierre, White House Press Secretary, said, here's the difference between Democrats and MAGA Republicans. When a Democrat says something racist or anti-Semitic, we hold Democrats accountable. When a MAGA Republican says something racist or anti-Semitic, they are embraced by cheering crowds. Uh, okay, read the rest of this here. Read the rest of this article. This is from October 15, 2022, Washington Post. Racist GOPs heat up in uh, weeks before midterms. Heat up in weeks before midterms. Let me put this back, this article back in the stack it came from. Just a second. All right, now, uh, let's get this stack back right here. We got that, that's Vice. Oh, the, 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 the last article. I wanted to look at this here dealing with crime. Hold on, let's put this stack together. This was a Koi massacre. See, this is... These are just, I have two stacks. So I have two big stacks of articles. This is half of like one of the stacks of articles that's to my right. These are like all recent articles. Like this is some stuff. This is from my file on reparations because I'm, I'm on a reparations panel tomorrow. California calls for comprehensive reparations. This is, so I have a file folder of reparations. This is like just part of the file folder, but this is the stack here all this stuff this is like all recent research this is uh i was pulling some information on criminal justice like biden signs executive order on policing two years after george floyd's death all this stuff okay this is all this is from cbs news right so because i had to go I have a file on the biden harris administration so this is um this is like half of the stack okay and then I got two stats on the desk next to me. And then I've got one, two, three, four stacks of articles on the floor that are about two feet high, a foot and a half, two feet high. So uh this piece right here. Let me see. It, we've got Okay, I Googled it. Well, this is Yahoo. Um, red states and more crime. Let 
me pull this up. So Republicans focusing on crime, that is a rich, that, that is a uh, Southern strategy. The, okay, so let's look at this article here quickly from Yahoo News. This is from Chambersburg Public Opinion. Uh, when is, uh, however, let me see some of the Fox News. Where's the meat of the article? Okay, this article here. And I've seen some analysis on on this topic, how crime is worse in, in Republican states than Democratic states. Do Republican or Democratic states have more crime? Do Republican or Democratic states have more crime? This is from June 15, 2022, by Bill Genlis Gen Sperger. What is it? Ginless Burger, Sperger. So he says the Fox News Network, the Fox Network, Newsmax, and other right wing propaganda machines have blamed Democrats for rising crime rates so often and for so long that. Many of us believe the narrative and have made it part of our knowledge base, except it is wrong, except it is wrong. On the other hand, it is accurate that the murder rate in the U.S. has gone up at an alarming rate. On the other hand, despite the right wing media narrative, to the contrary, this is a problem that afflicts Republican run cities in states more than democratic states okay it is a problem that afflicts republican run cities and republican run states more than democratic states now that's contrary to the campaign ads that republicans are running right now using a southern strategy and scaring white people of crime and white people about crime and really trying to scare them about African-Americans and Latinos regarding crime. That's really what this is about. So the article goes on to say, in fact, in 2020, the per capita murder rates were 40% higher in states won by Donald Trump than those won by Joe Biden. In 2020, the per capita, C-A-P-I-T-A, per capita murder rates were 40% higher in states won by Donald Trump than states won by Joe Biden, according to Washington think tank, uh, Third Way, W-A-Y. In eight of the 10 states with the highest murder rates in the year 2020, Americans voted for the Republican presidential nominee in every election this century. In eight of the 10 states with the highest murder rates in 2020, Americans voted for Republican presidential nominees in every election this century. The problem is that reducing murder rates is not about pointing a finger at others, avoiding the problem by putting your head in the sand, but rather accepting responsibility for the problem and resolving it. Fox News continuously posts headlines claiming that all time high murder rates are a democratic problem because Democrats are soft on crime. As Fox News puts it, police reform is responsible for the rise in murder in democratic strongholds like New York City, Los Angeles, California, Chicago, Baltimore, Philadelphia, and Minneapolis. But the devil is in, in the details. 
it turns out that murder rates are far higher in Donald Trump voting Republican states than Joe Biden voting Democratic states. It turns out that murder rates are far higher in Donald Trump voting Republican states than Joe Biden voting Democratic states. This is also true of Republican cities with Republican mayors such as Jacksonville, Florida. Interestingly, the murder rate in Democratic Speaker Nancy Pelosi's Nancy Pelosi, San Francisco is half the murder rate of House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy's Bakersfield, uh, California. And Bakersfield, California voted overwhelmingly for Donald Trump and also has a Republican mayor. Democrat Pelosi's district is half the murder rate of Republican Kevin McCarthy's district. Comparing murder rates for all 50 states clearly shows that, Repub that the Republican narrative that Democrats are soft, are soft on crime begs to be debunked. The point is that Republican office holders and their supporters would seem to be doing a better job of blaming Democrats for crime than actually in reducing the crime rate. Okay, Republican office holders and their supporters would seem, to, it seems that they're actually doing a better job of blaming Democrats for crime than actually in reducing the crime rate. According to Fox News, murder rates are skyrocketing in New York and California and Illinois, yet these three states are not even within the top 10 crime-ridden states. And you should note that of the uh, 10 states with the highest murder rates, eight of those 10 states voted for Donald Trump in 2020, and none have supported a Democrat for president since 1996. Okay? Eight of the 10 states with the highest murder rates in the country voted for Donald Trump in 2020. And none have supported a Democrat for president since 1996. These are the top 10 most crime-ridden states based on murders per 100,000 residents. That's per capita. So they're looking at per 100,000 residents, okay? Uh, crimes per, so this is looking specifically at murders. Murders per 100,000 residents. Number one is Mississippi, two, Louisiana, Kentucky is number three, Alabama number four, Missouri is number five, South Carolina six, New Mexico seven, Georgia is eight, uh, Arkansas 9, Tennessee 10. Basically, all these are in the South. Only number seven, New Mexico, and number eight, Georgia, voted for Joe Biden. The remaining eight states are solidly Republican states and voted for Donald Trump. Of states voting Democrat, uh, uh, voting for Democratic, of uh, states voting Democratic, New York, California, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Illinois are on par with the national crime average. Mississippi's murder rate is four times the murder rate of of the state of New York, and two point five times the murder rate. Of the state of California, that, that that's looking at how many murders per one hundred thousand people in those states. Okay, it's not looking at the total number of murders. It's looking at per capita how many murders per one hundred thousand people. Mississippi's murder rate per one hundred thousand people is four times greater than the murder rate in the state of New York and two and a half times greater than the murder rate in the state of California. The five states with the highest 
murder rates are all Republican states and Trump voting states. Read the rest of this article here. See, this is this is totally contrary to the to, to the ads that Republicans are running talking about crime and they don't have they don't have they don't have um, real policies to deal with the rising crime especially in their republican state they don't have real policies to deal with that they definitely don't have policies to deal with inflation republicans they definitely don't have policies to deal with inflation okay let's see here let me post this link all right how y'all like this type of information okay who still needs to register for the uh online history cl classes i teach we teach them normally tuesdays 7 p.m to 9 p.m eastern standard time we're going to teach a late class here we're going to jump in for about a half hour 45 minutes and then uh we'll, we'll do uh we'll um do some more this weekend uh i'm flying to uh um hold on what is this uh yeah this was right there. Okay, they just said okay. They're gonna start. They're gonna start the uh, Roland Martin broadcast uh, 7 p.m. instead of 6 p.m. on Tuesday. Yeah, they'll do 7 p.m. probably to 1 a.m. Yeah, so because I fly to um, Washington D.C. Tuesday morning. All right. So if you like this type of information, you definitely want to register for our online history classes. Okay, this helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, pay the bills. Because I because the, the two digital platforms that i use to teach these classes so i have to pay each month for that also this stuff is not free for me to teach these classes and it's very time consuming also um but this helps us keep doing the research stay on the air pay some of the bills it helps me uh cover expenses when i have to travel out of state like going uh, let me pull this up. Okay. So uh, Tuesdays, it is from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 18, 1968. Let me read screen. Stand by. Okay, we should be back. All right, we're back. Okay, uh, here's the link here to register for the classes. So Tuesdays, normally 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, I teach from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. Uh, we're running late today, so I'm going to jump in and teach it uh, Tuesday class as soon as it finishes broadcast. Um, so right here, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement of Black Power, 1865 to 1968. Class is on sale, $80, readily $130. Click right here to register here. We, we um, do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime, even a year from now, two years from now. Then on Wednesdays, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I teach um, from the Civil War. I teach ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And we deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Now, we were going to do, um, uh, I was going to make these eight-week classes, but it, it, we're going to end up doing 10 weeks, okay? All right, Cleo, we've got your uh, registration. So thanks for registering for the class, Cleo. And if you want to do the bundle uh, pack, uh, email me through the website, like Cleo, and it'll get upgraded to the bundle at a discount. So this one here, we deal with uh, the history. We deal with uh, ancient Kemet, ancient ancient Egypt. We do an ancient we deal with the history, some of the history of the Moors. In Europe, we do what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Also, you can register for both classes. We have a bundle pack for one hundred thirty dollars. 
click right here register here for the bundle you get both classes uh that's a, over 300 dollars value because it's going to be it's like about a 360 dollars value because it's going to be some bonus presentations you get from me in digital form that, that i'm uploading to the uh platform and uh, you can use debit card credit card click register here if you're taking any of my online classes in the past e email me at ahn show at african history network.com ahn show at african at, at the african history network.com ahn show at the african history network.com and you get a 50 percent discount or email us through the website at the top of the page just click on uh contact the african history network or, or click on menu if you're on a smartphone it'll show up as menu and then click on contact the african history network okay um and uh, you'll get a discount okay so the two different uh classes that i teach you can register for those appreciate the support and then uh let me put up the cash app information here Let me just show you this quickly. This is our official cash app account, dollar sign, the EHN show, S-H-O-W. Those that follow me, you know that there's some fake African History Network cash app accounts out there. That's why I created this graphic. I'm trying to get them shut down. Um, I had cash app opened up an investigation some months ago. They're very slow. I just talked to them a couple of weeks ago. They're still doing an investigation. There's like five fake African History Network cash up accounts out there that i've identified and they've been stealing money from us so this is our official cash up account dollar sign the ahn show that's our tag dollar sign the ahn show uh, dollar sign the ahn show s-h-o-w i mean you go to it it'll say michael and if you click right here on the link it takes you to a qr code so you can scan this also right here this is our official cash app account our only cash app account those other ones are, are, are fake cash app accounts all right and then we have the link for uh paypal also so let me post this here uh as well okay so this is the link for the courses And then also for uh, PayPal and Cash App. Now, on let's see, if you saw the African History Network show on uh, Sunday, October 30th, we talked about the uh, Midwest decarbonization uh, conference coming up. And uh, I have my niece, Chris Jackson, my niece Jackson on talking about uh the conference and i'm speaking there on wednesday november 2nd 3 p.m to 4 p.m and friday november 4 3 p.m to 4 p.m pull this up this is for the uh conference and a lot of the, conf the the panel I'm on, we're dealing with uh, reparations and environmental justice. Okay. This is, let me post the link here. And I'm going to put a link on the website, uh, on our website, the African History Network. Uh, I got to get that link up. It's been busy. I've been busy. 2022 Equity Summit. It's a three day summit, Wednesday, November 2nd um it's like 9 a.m to 4 p.m each day wednesday november 2nd through friday november 4th 2022 okay and the, uh, this, is a, this is a virtual this is a virtual uh conference a virtual conference and it's free to register the entire conference is free uh let me see here we scroll down understanding uh narrative and numbers using historical data from black bottom detroit gentrification case uh this is the uh, one of the panels i'm on coming up at 3 p.m advancing reparations and building decarbonization advancing reparations and building decarbonization 
so I'm on this panel. The session will offer attendees an understanding of reparations and how this concept can be applied to energy justice, how implicit bias shows up in environmental climate justice work, and how the potential for community ownership and the potential for community ownership of clean energy. How can utilities repair for utility shutoffs, pipeline bursts, and poor air quality? Facilitate, facilitated by Marlise Jackson. Uh, she's the co-director of the uh, Midwest uh, Building Decarbonization Coalition, created by Russell Rabb. So I'm one of the panelists. And then I'm speaking on Friday. Or I'm on the panel on Friday also. So check this out. I'll post the link here. The website is Midwest Decarb, D E, Midwest D E C A R B, Midwest Decarb.org forward slash summit schedule. Midwest Decarb.org forward slash summit or forward slash summit schedule. Either one. And let me post the link here. Okay, so it's free to uh, register, and you can watch, you know, from around. All right, let's see. 2022 X Summit. This is the, let's see here. Okay, yeah. If you go to uh, MidwestDCarb.org forward slash summit, it takes you here. And then you can click on the schedule. This is what I was looking for. Midwest Building Decarbonization Coalition 2022 Equity Summit. Wednesday, November 2nd through Friday, November 4th, 22. This year theme, this year's theme centers uh around the second principle of Kwanzaa, Kuji Chagalia, we'll be exploring how we empower communities and collectively move forward in the building decarbonization movement. The three-day summit will uplift multiple sessions on topics ranging from regulatory engagement to reparations and the land back movement. In an effort to make the summit more accessible, we will be hosting all of the sessions sessions virtually on Zoom, and there will be no cost to attend. Okay, so I, um, I'm part of that also. So here, let's see, and let's post this uh, here. There we go. Got that. All right, look, hey, we have to get out of here. Uh, remember, the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world, because right now it's correct wrong behavior. You can join us in class. Now you can register for the class. Then I teach another one Wednesday after uh, the conference, so Wednesday also 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we have the second class. All right, we have to get out of here. Thanks for joining us. We'll talk to you next time. Peace.